Welcome, it's indisputable, I'm your host, Rashad Richard, good to be with you. We have a lot to cover today. Breaking down news of the day, none other than Jeff Wiggins, Rebel HQ contributor and host of We Gonna Be All Right. Always a fascinating analysis. Top story of the day, the United States Supreme Court decides to eliminate affirmative action inside of higher education. This is just the beginning. Let's put up the picture full mass. The individuals who were in charge of this decision. The Supreme Court now says that colleges and universities can no longer take race into consideration as a specific basis for granting admission. A landmark decision overturning long standing precedent that has benefited black and Latino students in higher education. Affirmative action, ladies and gentlemen, has also benefited white women. I will get into that momentarily. Let's put up how the vote broke down. SCOTUS rules against affirmative action in college admissions. You have your majority opinion and your dissent. Majority opinion and the dissent. The dissent makes way more sense than the majority opinion. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the opinion for the conservative majority, saying the Harvard and University of North Carolina admissions programs violated the equal protection clause because they failed to offer measurable objectives to justify the use of race. He said the programs involve racial stereotyping and had no specific end point. The majority opinion claims that the court was not expressly overturning prior cases authorizing race based affirmative action and suggested that how race was affected has affected an applicant's life can still be part of how their application is considered. But even if the court did not formally end race based affirmative action in higher education, its analysis will make it practically impossible for colleges and universities to take race into account. As the three Democratic appointees stressed in their dissent. Let me give you the statement from Justice Clarence Thomas, who has benefited from affirmative action his damn self. In a lengthy concurrence, which isn't even necessary, Justice Clarence Thomas, the second black person to join the Supreme Court, spoke in unusually personal terms as he criticized the use of affirmative action by colleges and universities. When he described, which he described as rudderless, Race based preferences designed to ensure a particular racial mix in their entering classes. Let's go to statements for Justice Jackson. In her own dissent, Justice Katanja Brown Jackson accused the conservative majority of having a let them eat cake. Obliviousness in how the court's affirmative action ruling announced color blindness for all by legal fiat. But deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. Mm. She said, joined by the court's two other liberals, Justice Jackson wrote that the majority had detached itself from this country's actual past and present experience. Now understand, the majority opinion is the opinion of those who will say to anyone wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt, all lives matter as a rebuttal. But see, if all lives matter, we would not need a campaign that said Black Lives Matter. You see, there's a correction required in the context of understanding the now. The court 
has provided that routinely. Sometimes they have failed, other times they have offered to remedy. There's more. No one benefits from ignorance, she added. A footnote in her dissent when after the majority concurrence by Justice Clarence Thomas, the only other black justice on the court, his opinion also demonstrates an obsession with race consciousness that far outstrips my or UNC's holistic understanding that race can be a factor that affects applicants unique life experiences. Jackson added, saying that his concurrence ignites many more straw men to list or fully extinguish here. The takeaway is that those who demand that no one think about race, a classic pink elephant paradox, refuse to see, much less solve for the elephant in the room, the race linked disparities that continue to impede achievement of our great nation's full potential. The footnote said, in her broader dissent, Justice Jackson said that the argument made by the challengers that affirmative action programs are unfair, quote, blinks both history and reality in ways too numerous to count. Conservative groups efforts in overturning affirmative action challengers in the case targeted Harvard and the University of North Carolina, arguing that their programs violate equal protection principles, dashed the promise of a colorblind society and discriminated against Asian Americans. They were targeted, I'm saying this personally, they were targeted by way of strategy. This is why they use this strategy. They ask the court to overturn precedent and insist that higher education should explore and further develop race neutral alternatives to achieve diversity. Race neutral alternatives to obtain diversity. A conservative group students for fair missions was behind both challenges. Now I want you to look at the data. I'm a college professor, so right after this ruling came out, we had a major administrative meeting. And in this administrative meeting today, we looked at the variables that exist currently and what may exist in the future. While it is bad today, it can be worse tomorrow. Let me explain. Right now, the colleges that are absolutely affected by this particular ruling are going to be colleges that have competitive entry. Over 90% of colleges in America for undergrad studies, they do not have true competitive academic allowance. Meaning that for the most part, those who apply, as long as there's room, you meet the bare minimum requirements, you get in. There may be some level of 099 curriculum required, but you can get into the institution. However, This goes beyond just the institutional dynamic. But look at the hypocrisy of this. How can affirmative action be deemed unconstitutional? But no one has brought up legacy students. Students that have provided nothing more than the fact of who their mama and daddy is. Oh, that's just fine. Nobody's dealing with that. Let's go beyond universities and colleges. You see, this strikes at the very core of what they've been attempting and successfully doing for a few years. You see, when Trump was running for president the first time, and he said, make America great again, he was president for four years attempted to execute this particular plan, this particular methodology. He did not have the discipline to do so. But you're seeing exactly what they were referring to now. Florida passing laws, making it basically illegal to be a protester and to be an activist who inconveniences somebody else. If you make white people uncomfortable in Florida, good luck. 
you may get your business license snatched. If you are an educator, you now are restricted on what you can teach as it relates to race in the United States of America. It, it goes on and on. When is this going to stop? It doesn't until you put the right people in office, until you yourself go and run for political office, until we transform the actual policy dynamic by way of the people dynamic. This does not stop, it only continues. So now this ruling prepares the next one. What is the next one? Outside of the institutional walls. All right, dear brother, ruling just came out. A lot of people are still trying to fix their minds around the fact that America has gutted affirmative action inside of institutions of higher learning. What say you? I'm glad you brought up legacy admissions because that proves for white students, it was never really about merit. And I wanna add to that, there's also children who are uh, children of donors, faculty and staff. Colorblindness yep. was never the law of the land in this country. I guess we're supposed to like believe that, I don't know, 45 or 46 presidents, 73% of current Congress, and like 97% of the Supreme Court justices we have in this country weren't selected because of their skin color. So we know what race neutrality is and we know who is gonna benefit. It's gonna benefit white people. You don't have to have merit in order for a lot of these institutions in this country to be primarily and majority white. That's what I right. think moving forward. Right, we will bring you updates as they come. But please understand this ruling will have the effect of the first domino falling. The intent of the group who brought these cases was not simply to eliminate affirmative action inside of higher education. It was to set the platform, the groundwork to go beyond that. And that becomes the fight tomorrow. All right. Hell of a thing, radio personality, a remarkable person, all right? She says she was discriminated against by, well, a worker who wrote a racial slur on the receipt. She found it, she saw it, here it is. I just had a very racist situation just happen to me, right here in Buckhead. And I need to tell you guys about it. Last night, my friend Kendra and I, we were right right next door to this place, had an amazing time. But she pointed out this place called Woody's, Woody's Cheesesteaks, right? She said, they have an amazing veggie cheesesteak. I said, well, I'm going to be in the area. I'm going to go and get one. So I'm here to get one today. I'm all excited. I was like, you know, what are you having your cheesesteaks? And he was just like, oh, it's no use, it's all vegetables. And I said, all right, cool. I placed my order. What is your name? I said, Darlene. This joker put D A. And I'm going to show you. He put for my name. And I saw it because, you know, I paid like through my phone on the. So it came up on, on the um, thing. I'm like, why would you call me? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I know your name is Darlene. I said, so why didn't you put Darlene? Let's put up a picture full mass. You see, Darlene is a nationally syndicated radio host and gospel artist, Darlene Jackson McCoy. Remarkable individual. One of the most authentic people you will ever meet. She says after ordering a vegetable cheesesteak at Woody's Cheesesteaks in the Buckhead neighborhood of North Atlanta, she noticed the cashier wrote a racial slur. It is historically a racial slur next to the section that should have said 
her name. McCoy proceeded to explain how unapologetic the cashier was. Here it is. Why did you put And he was like, don't worry about it. It's just, that's just for me. I'm like, what is, I don't wanna be called so cancel my order and give me my money back. He says, I'm not doing that. I don't give money back. I don't give refunds. Look at that. When he called my name, he said, Darlene. I came up, I said, please give me my receipt. And he said, it's nothing. I mean, I just put for my, just for me. I'm like, no, you put and I'm a black woman. That is extremely insensitive. And I asked you to change it. And you told me you wouldn't change it. I asked you to give me my money back because I don't even want the food. You said you don't give refunds. And he said, don't worry about all of that. I said, you know, had you been a little bit apologetic, had you shown a little bit of, of, of humanity in this, I wouldn't do what I'm about to do. But you got the right one, baby. You got the right one. I'm very sick of racism in this society. I'm sick of it. And I'm not going to allow this to go. Good for you, dear sister. Put up the receipt. I want to see it again. All right, that's the receipt. Keep that receipt up there. Now, let me say this. Something I tell my college students often is to never compromise. Because the way you allow someone to treat you will teach them how to treat the next person who looks like you. But you can give them a proper education if you do not compromise, which will also provide a necessary lesson of how to teach everyone how to teach them to treat everyone who comes after you. McCoy then proceeded to urge the public to take action. They have three locations in Atlanta. By the receipt, this happened under or at the Buckhead location. Um, I think there was a response that said it was a typo. Hmm. The restaurant, I believe, said it was a typo. That's a hell of a typo. Uh, I mean, that was a typo that existed in various word combinations mm -hmm. in order for that to be a typo. Uh, dear brother, here's the thing. She was right about if he simply would have at least been halfway apologetic, she would have dropped it. And knowing her character, I don't know her personally, but I know of her character, uh, she's telling the truth. She would have shown some grace in the moment. But according to her narrative, there was zero grace allocated and zero apology once discovered. What say you? Whoever this person was kept saying it's for me and then gave her the receipt which included the racial slur on it. It was yeah. clearly for her, he gave it to her. So I don't know what he could possibly be talking about. It was completely intentional. And there's a lot of different ways that could be a typo. But the fact that it went that way it ended up being the way it was, there was no L in there. That was <laughs> that's a sad excuse. For an individual, if all of this proved to be true, I don't know her personally, but this is awful. Yeah, she's a great person. All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read the comments. Thank you for joining the combo. Mickey C, <clears throat> the Silverhead Dragon says, let us not forget that because Clarence Thomas is married to a white woman, in his mind, that means <clears throat> that he is white too. He fails to examine the fact that if he dares to step out of line of his white masters, his skin would darken quickly. No, he knows. <laughs> he knows. Uh, Shadik Anderson, thank you. <clears throat> Clarence, damn Thomas. That's, that's all you gotta say. That says everything right there. I'm glad 
um, Justice Jackson clapped back at his ass directly, even though he was not submitting the majority opinion. She said, yeah, brother, you're gonna get some of this. Good for you, Justice. Yeah, he killed that dissent, man, that was beautiful. Yeah. Oh man, her dissent was amazing. Uh, Natural born Keeler, welcome to Indisputable, thank you for joining. Uh, also, gifted one indisputable subscription, we appreciate that. Olivia, remember for two months, thank you, Olivia. Robert Pratt, welcome to Indisputable. Twitch, subscribe with Prime, you have been here 18 months, talking about Sir Chanova. Do the pronunciation thing you all do if I messed that up, I apologize if I did so, all right. Okay, what if I told you police officers, mom and dad, cops, put their child in jail for a potty issue? Put them in handcuffs for a potty issue. Put up the picture for a mask. That's exactly what the accusation is. According to the Daytona Beach News Journal, Detective Sergeant Jessica Long and Lieutenant Michael Schoenbrock, these are people with rank. A Daytona Beach Shores police officer couple allegedly handcuffed their three year old son and put him in jail as a way to discipline him for being difficult with his potty training. The child was jailed twice. First offense came on October 5th, second offense was October 6th, according to the report. It was the second time they decided he was a repeat offender and decided to put handcuffs on the three year old child. He was crying, I was getting the response I expected from him. Daytona Beach Shores Police Lieutenant Dad told the Department of Children and Families caseworker, adding that the child promised to never poop in his pants again after he was put in jail. The lieutenant admitted that he used the tactic years ago when he disciplined his then four year old son for hitting a girl in preschool. Quote, I took him to the jail and he sat there and I watched him and he was crying and everything. And to this day, if you mention like that incident, he's just like, I would never do that again. It was effective, the lieutenant told the caseworker. So that's why I did it with this, he didn't hit anybody, but I figured the same thing, discipline. And he didn't wanna go back, so he added, it's not known if these cops faced any discipline over the matter. The results of the Department of Children and Family Investigation is not known, so I have provided what is known. I have provided what is part of the public narrative and public record. As it relates to them, not as parents only, but as members of law enforcement serving in a position of massive public trust. Should there not be an investigation from the police department? Why is it that only the child or the children's services coordinator involved? If a person is willing to lock up a three year old child and stand by that decision and then admit that this is routine conduct by doing it to their other child. What do you think these individuals are willing to do to you as a citizen of that community? You gotta ask the right questions here, I'm talking to the people in that local area. If this is something justified in their minds, what else do you think would be justified against you? All right, dear brother thoughts here. I'm trying to figure out what went wrong here as far as like other avenues they could have gone down in order to prevent this from happening. Did they try other approaches or are their minds so in the fact that Discipline in this manner is the only thing that's gonna work. Because if they feel that way, they wouldn't have put him in jail multiple times. 
They have to do something different is my point here. But that's not the, the nature of law enforcement in this country. We know that something like, hey man, if you successfully poop in the potty, I'll give you another Spider-Man or something like that. <laughs> something right. would have gone better, but it's yet another failure of our law enforcement systems in this country. It is insanity on top of insanity. How do you even get handcuffs to fit on a three year old child? Do I you don't really even want to find out how? Like, Just I don't want to try. Yeah. All right. Got something for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're I feel great. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Later. A few moments later. One eternity later. I hate you. So much later that the old narrator got tired of waiting and they had to hire a new one. All right. He was repeating the N word over and over again, trying to provoke this cop to act out of line. Let's put it up full mass. Unbothered. Mm. What he did not know is that while she is a police officer by day. She's actually an anti Karen by night. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, it was an attempt to basically make one of the officers step out of line and do something against him by yelling the N word over and over and over again. Well, they respected his constitutional right. To free speech. Don't have to like it. I don't like it. But Killer Mike told me something real wise one day. He <laughs> said, Doc, freedom of speech allows us to know who our enemies are, and mm -hmm. we can then act accordingly. Profound. All right, dear brother, uh, didn't work. It may have worked before with someone else, but it didn't work this time. Thoughts? He used his free speech to be racist. He right. could have said something to a lot of different other people who were in that image. Yeah. But he chose to go after that woman in particular because of her race. And as I already said earlier, we don't live in a colorblind race neutral society. We never did, we never will. So that's what free speech gives us as the proprietor of Run the Jewels put it. We know who he is and we know who our enemy is now. That's right. Uh, and by the way, for the officer, well done. Mm. You showed um, respect and professionalism, and you didn't give a damn, it seemed like, and that was good. Okay, got something for you. Double dose. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're going to feel great. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Go away. I don't know what you're saying. What are you doing? My car is not even on. Oh, the drama. Okay, here's one of those. I don't know if it's real or fake moments of Karenicity. So I want to pose the question to you. Is this authentic or is it not? Now, I will say this. If I would have seen the video maybe 10 years ago, I would have said, obviously, this person is acting. This is a skit. But ladies and gentlemen, we have seen Karens in the wild now. We cannot say that this couldn't be real today. We've seen too much. I want to go back. Let's replay the performance one more time. Mm -hmm. Here it is. Go away. I don't know what you're saying. What are you doing? My car is not even on. Let's put up the picture. Let's see if we can find some evidence in the screenshot. All right. 
I mean, that looks like Karenicity to me, but I could be wrong. It is unclear if this video is staged or real. It was removed by the moderators of our public freak out, uh, but we do have it. So let me go to a guy who actually is funny, is a professional at funny. Was this a joke? Was this a script or was it really a Karen moment? Mm, he stumped. Uh -oh. I don't want to sway public opinion. <laughs> I say this about myself. I should do a better job at watching our Karen videos ahead of time because I almost lost it the first time I thought that. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I will say this. I'm 60%, 60% okay. that is real. 40% staged. Okay. That's what I'm, I'm going to check the comments to see where people are. Maybe I can be swayed uh, one way or another. I think that's a very fair analysis, sir, given the current information that we have. Okay, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read some of these comments. And opine. Mo Fury, pay attention, folks. Cops arresting their own children for not earning their potty training badge fast enough is how you turn a child into an a hole adult. Yep, who may believe that's the way to do it. Trista, we apparently have to train American kids for the oppressive police state as early as possible. Real or fake? Mo Fury, why is actress Karen wearing my grandma's sofa for a shirt? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, C. Michael Henson, these are the same types of cops that will force someone out of their car for a minor traffic infraction, and they will lock up their own child. Yeah, they'll do more than that. Hell, they may put you in jail because you didn't learn your lesson when you were three. Okay, radio host Tammy Warren, what did it say? Talking about the word, all right, the slur that was bleeped out. They block the words and bleeping. They don't believe all the cussing they do in YouTube. Why? So let me explain that. Uh, that's one of the words that is a racial slur. We do not use racial slurs without beeping them out. We beep out the N word and all uh, other variations. If you would like to know what the actual word is, it is available in written content. You Google the story, it is there, okay? You too, James Thompson, member for 11 months. Thank you for that. Mom's 93rd birthday, dinner and dancing. My sister and I spent the week together. Um, happy birthday to mom and big ups to having such a great family. All right, thank you for supporting the program. Snack underscore Panther, member for 10 months, thank you for that. Affirmative action gave Clarence Thomas and Clarence Uncle Thomas took it away. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming, I should have read it before here. All right, <laughs> affirmative action gave, Clar gave us Clarence Thomas and Clarence Uncle Thomas took it away out of spite. Not by good legal argument. And Twitch. Okay. Yep. Uh, Natural Born Keeler 2022. I'm watching this from a German perspective. This feels insane to me. The US is so much like Germany in the 1920s. Wow. Get on the watchtower. Wow, man. All right. A fire chief, a fire chief and his son decide. To hold a child at gunpoint, a teen. Let's put up his picture full mask. That's according to the story. Townsville, Fire Chief Billy McAdams. Now remember, this is a whole damn chief, along with his son, allegedly chased two South Carolina teens, held them at gunpoint. The parents, of the two teens have now filed a civil lawsuit against the father son duo. After the two men chased down the children, falsely imprisoned minors during the late summer of 2022. The fire chief admitted to pointing his pistol at them and making them lie down, lie down on the ground until authorities got there. The chief and his son have since flip flopped their confession. Let me give you the background. 
The children were scouting out a couple of goose hunting locations along Lake Hartwell. While driving around, the pair got lost and needed to find a marker to help them get their bearings. That's normative. One of the markers where the two decided to make a turnaround was the driveway of the Townville Fire Chief, Billy McAdams. McAdams and his son swiftly hopped in their respective trucks and started chasing down the children. They chased the teens from Anderson County to Oconee County. Once in Oconee County, they called the boys called 911, explaining they were being chased with guns. When the McAdams were able to catch up with the children, the fire chief pulled his weapon out and told them they were being held because they suspiciously went on his property. Court documents say the fire chief admitted to telling the young men to lie down on the road. He also admitted he forced them to prostrate with a gun. The Oconee operator overheard the entire escalation and told the Anderson dispatcher to tell the fire chief to put his gun away. To his dismay, McAdams had already ended the call. According to an incident filed in Oconee County, a judge found probable cause to issue a warrant to the Anderson fire chief, the caveat is that he would also have to issue a warrant to the teens. There's more, the case was eventually closed with no resolution. New information prompted law enforcement to reopen the case according to a Coney County Sheriff Office spokesperson, Jimmy Watt. The criminal case will be investigated by the county's Criminal Investigations Bureau. So let me explain to you what's happening here. It happens a lot in rural communities, small towns. When the narrative says the judge um, could have sent a warrant out to arrest the fire chief, but he would have also had to send a warrant to arrest the teenagers. That is a classic backyard justice approach. When they say things like, yeah, we can we can do the right thing here. Yep, yeah, we can put a warrant out. That was wrong what he did. But listen, if I put the warrant out, I gotta also do it for the teenagers that were chased. Then all of a sudden, everybody wants things to drop. And so the case went forward and then it stopped. At that point with the judge, when the judge put that out, the case comes to a halt. Because obviously the children did nothing wrong and they don't want to be arrested, especially there. When the fire chief likely knows everybody inside of that jail, okay, that works there. So they drop everything. But here's The reality of the law, law is very clear. Unintentional trespass is an affirmative defense to criminal trespass allegations. As long as the children did not have a malicious or intentional um, dynamic connected to them being on the property, it is considered unintentional, so unintentional trespass. The judge does not have to put out a warrant for the teens. The judge can say that's an unintentional trespass. But what the chief and the chief son did was intentional. See how that works? All right, Jeff, thoughts here. It's a sad state of affairs where I'm thankful that someone did not get shot by turning around in a driveway because that could have easily happened. Because back in April, Kaylin Gillis and three of her friends were trying to find another friend's house in rural Heber, New York, when they mistakenly pulled up to the house owned by Kevin Monahan. And he shot and killed someone for this very same thing. It seems like something standard that humans do, but for other people, shooting people who do these things is very standard. So I'm glad humans are alive in this situation. Now, if we could do something about the injustice that's caused by the police, which is another standard thing in this country. Yeah, and also fire chiefs that want to act like corrupt cops. Okay, let me warn you before I do this. Um, it's not going to be pretty. So Roseanne Barr, um, here it is. <laughs> Big fat and Lizzo being so proud of herself. I laid the groundwork for you and you've never even said thank you. 
I was the one that they wrote all the shit about. Every fat joke in the world called me a cow and a pig. Even in Time and Newsweek, they called me a cow and a fat pig. And, you know, now they're talking about fat acceptance. Won't you all kiss my fat accepting <laughs> I did the work. Roseanne Barr is either on something or off of something. That's my opinion. Put up the picture for a mask. Okay, Roseanne calls out Lizzo and claims that Lizzo needs to tell Roseanne. Thank you, Roseanne. Roseanne would write post about it online. When is Lizzo going to thank me paving the way? It's appropriate to question why Barr would like for Lizzo to give her credit for paving a way when many successful plus size women of color, such as Missy Elliott, Jill Scott, Queen Latifah, Monique and others opened the doors for the generation of women that followed behind them according to Atlanta Black Star. There's more, Lizzo has not yet addressed Barr's comments. Likely because she's living her best life in Poland. According to her Instagram, she recently attended, uh, recently attended a recent stop on Beyonce's Renaissance World Tour. Um, she's definitely living a remarkable, successful career, highly talented, outspoken, smart. And maybe she responds. I'm kind of hoping she does, but maybe not. All right, Jeff, I don't I don't know where this came from with Roseanne Barr. I actually thought it was a damn joke. I thought she was being comedic, but it looks like Roseanne Barr is being 100% offended and authentic in her belief. What say you? Can we shift the paradigm about what thick and curvy people mm. do don't do in this country. And let's be clear here, Lizzo is in shape. And we know that Roseanne Barr cannot do an hour set of music, <laughs> playing the flute while dancing and calling everybody the B word. So why would Lizzo give her credit for anything? Like that's not a direct line between Rose, Roseanne Barr and Lizzo. So I'm glad you said that, cuz I didn't know where this came from either when I first heard about it. That has yeah. nothing to do with one another. She didn't have to right. bring her up. Exactly. All right, we got more on the other side. Is it disputable? Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show. Let me remind everyone that you can join Indisputable via YouTube. We would love to have you as an official member. Support our programming. By becoming a member at tyt.com forward slash join or hit the join button on YouTube. Not only do you get amazing perks as part of your membership, like emojis and badges, exclusive designs on shoptyt.com and more, but you also make a positive impact. When we expose human rights violations, you are exposing human rights violations. When we right wrongs, you are righting wrongs with us. We would love for you to become part of that team, all right? Okay, a lot of comments will read as many as I can. Make a city to a dragon says, what talent does Roseanne have other than being funny at one time? <laughs> That's great. Can she play a musical instrument well? Can she dance well? Yeah. Okay, I ain't gonna read that last one, but I get the point. Lynn says, did Tony Fields pave the way for Roseanne? Has Roseanne thanked her? Woo! Ooh. Also, see Michael Henson, thank you again. All oh, Roseanne and her feelings. Yeah, and it was so extreme. I said, it just has to be part of a comedy set, right? I'm still waiting for the you know, punchline or something. All right, it has gone viral on social media. A black food truck owner beaten on the street by a bigot, according to the report. Here's a video and we have background to it.
He just gets to walk away. Put up the picture of what this thug did to a hard working man. Look at that. Now put up the picture of him with his family. A black Oregon food truck owner reportedly was beaten, stopped, and called the N word by a random white person during a brutal altercation in front of his business. His attorneys claimed the police did not properly tend to him after the ordeal. According to reports, Daryl Preston was on the phone with his wife. In front of his Laurel's Chicken Shack food truck, when a man in, in a black jacket ambushed him on the sidewalk on Southeast Foster Road and 52nd Avenue. The lawyers report that witnesses rode by in cars, but no one, no one stopped to help. Look at the damage once again that was done. I know it's hard to watch. It's hard to look at, it's hard to see. It was harder for him to experience, never forget that. He deserves the story to be told correctly. According to Press's attorney, he suffered several facial injuries, could hardly speak. Portland police did arrive on the scene, but to the family's knowledge, they did not call an ambulance. They did not provide any medical care to Mr. Preston at all. His attorney, Montgomery, continued and said, Mr. Preston had to be driven to the hospital by his wife. And his face had to be wrapped in a shirt. Representatives for the Portland Police Bureau said the victim was not cooperative. And the officers did the best they could under the circumstances. According to Terry Wallow, the representative from the department's strategic communications unit, quote, It took officers several minutes to convince the victim to come out of the foot cart to talk with them. Once the victim was out, he told officers he was delivering food and was attacked. When the officer asked for more detail on exactly what happened, the victim refused to say more and locked himself in the cart. Wallow continued in a statement released five days after the incident. Let's go to Sergeant Kevin. Uh, Allen. So police spokesperson Sergeant Kev- Kevin Allen said PPB detectives from the police bureau's major crimes unit are now viewing the attack as a biased crime. There is no information on the identity of the attacker or if he has been apprehended or not. The uh, This is, you have the chief, uh, Portland's chief of police, Chuck Lovell and Sergeant Kevin Allen. As for taking Preston to the hospital, Allen says officers can't overstep their boundaries. It would not have been appropriate for the officer to override the patient's wishes, Allen said. Now remember there's a contradictory here because the attorneys are saying the cops refused to provide a proper attention to him. And let me say this, all speculation, I wasn't there. But I have seen situations like this and I've been in situations like this. If you are a black male victim, typically the police will treat you like you committed a crime. Mm-hmm. Why, did, why did this happen to you? What were you doing? What else are you involved in? See, those things happen routinely. And if that was the line of question, I can see why. The victim decided to lock himself inside to get away from them. There's more. Officers also thought they were responding to someone being struck by a car, according to the officials. Now, which lot is it, Sarge? Which one? Either the cops did not want to override the patient or they thought it was a different type of situation. Anytime somebody gives you more than one reason for doing the wrong thing, they lie. There's more. Upon arrival and talking to the firefighters responding to that crisis, they learned about Preston's assault. Firefighters told them 
that both the victim and suspect left the scene already. Let's put up the GoFundMe. Man working hard, middle of the day, gets attacked broad daylight. Not a single member of his community provides any help. They just drive by. He could have died. Preston's brother-in-law has set up a GoFundMe to help with medical costs, legal representation, other business costs. Says he has been able, unable, unable to work the food cart. You can donate right now. We ask that you do the very best you can. Here we are. You know, if police officers or the industry known as policing did a better job at community relations, which really isn't difficult. All you got to do is stop shooting unarmed, historically marginalized people. That would be a good start. You would not have this massive disconnect, this us them mentality, the distrust that permeates inside of the culture. But because you refuse to do those things. Generally, people are distrustful of the police. 94% of Americans do not trust the cops, 94%, 94. We're talking about all races, all backgrounds, all political affiliations. That's a problem in the industry of policing. We will follow this story, bring you updates as they come. Um, as I said, we are not aware that this person has been apprehended. Let's put up the picture one more time. Um, even though there is a pretty clear screen grab of what he looks like. Somebody knows him, somebody knows him, all right? Justice needs to be served. Um, contact local law enforcement if you have any information. All right, Jeff, thoughts here? Yeah, I'm glad you ended it with, as of right now, we don't know who this individual is. I was scrolling through social media to see if we can find a name or something like that. Because if there's one thing that I appreciate about social media, is that when there's an injustice like this and we have a screen grab or an image of the person's face, Twitter does its thing. So that's what I'm asking for right now. Twitter, yep. do your thing. Do your thing. All right, this is an update. Five Mississippi cops are now off the job. We covered this. They basically, according to the allegation, kidnapped two black men held them hostage, sexually assaulted them, shot one in the face and more for allegedly dating white women, according to one narrative. Let's do this, put up the picture. Now we say from day one that these cops were dirty who did this to these men. All five officers who were involved have not been officially terminated. After the horror show of kidnapping, violently sexually, sexually assaulting and physically assaulting two black men, left one of them men shot in the mouth. The announcement comes months, months later from Rankin County Sheriff Brian Bailey, earlier accused of covering up the incident at a news conference on Tuesday. We learn, even though they have been fired, no officers have been charged. Quote, due to recent developments, including findings during our internal investigation, those deputies that were still employed by this department have all been terminated. Bailey said at a news conference, we understand that the alleged actions of these deputies has eroded the public's trust in the department, rest assured, that we will work diligently to restore that trust. The announcement came after the two men, Michael Corey Jenkins, 32, and Eddie Terrell Parker, 35, filed a federal lawsuit against the officers earlier this month. The lawsuit claims that six county deputies forcibly entered Mr. Parker's home in Braxton, Mississippi, and raided the property without a warrant on January 24th. That's when Mr. Jenkins and Mr. Parker said that they were beaten and stunned with tasers, abused with a sex toy, and made to strip naked in an ordeal that lasted nearly two damn hours. Let's put it up. As we've seen time and time again, the torturous incident sparked by an alleged drug bust 
is not the only heinous crime these officers have committed. Bailey's announcement also follows an Associated Press investigation that found several deputies who were involved with the episode were also linked to at least four other violent encounters with black men since 2019 that left two dead and another with a lasting injury. Deputies who had been accepted to the sheriff's office's special response team, special response team were involved in each and every one of those encounters. Malik Shabazz, attorney at law, seen in the video earlier recapping the incident, com- uh, commented on the announcement. The firing of the Rankin County Mississippi Sheriff's deputies involved in the torture and shooting of Michael Jenkins and Eddie Parker is a significant action on the path to justice for one of the worst law enforcement tragedies in recent memory. Sheriff Brian Bailey has finally acted after supporting much of the bloodshed that has occurred under his reign in Rankin County. The next credible and honorable step for Brian Bailey is to resign or be ousted. I concur. Obviously, these officers deserve to be charged. Now, you don't get fired from a Mississippi police department without committing a heinous crime, especially when the victim is a black man. There must be some significant evidence there. Do we know all of the evidence? No, they have not disclosed it to us. They have simply said it was enough for them to be fired. We will bring the bring you the update as it comes. Dear brother, thoughts. An Associated Press investigation that found that several deputies who were involved in this episode were also linked to at least four violent encounters with black men since 2019 that left two dead and another with lasting injuries. I know you said that, but I wanted to reiterate it because that's how we got here. If they were charged then, we wouldn't be here. So the lives and the injuries of these individuals are on the hands of this law enforcement agency in this uh, precinct who could have done something back in the day but failed to do so. And so that only emboldened these officers, by the way, feeling like they can get away with more stuff. So like you said, there must be some really damning evidence that we don't know about for them to finally fire these individuals. So hopefully there will be some charges. There's a civil liability doctrine called negligent hire. And that's when you literally literally either A, hire somebody that you know cannot do the job or they would do the job very poorly. Or B, you retain their employment knowing that they have acted in a way that could provide danger to those they serve. And naturally, we have at least evidence of one of those dynamics. And if you do an exhaustive background, if these individuals were cops before they got there, they probably have a history with that previous police department too. We will continue to update the story. All right, we got more the other side. Indisputable stick of stay. All right, welcome back. A lot of show left. Let me read a couple of comments. Press for time, cannot read them all. Thank you for joining the combo. Uh, buy the flavor corn pop. I'd like to donate to a go to a fund that will arrest and jail that piece of scum who did this. And nightmare. Uh oh. Hold on, let me find it. Okay, all right. Nightmare 316, the difference between you and Lizzo. Lizzo has talent in the class, you don't. Talking about Roseanne Barr. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, one of the saddest stories you will hear. One of the most avoidable scenarios. A 12 year old daughter, a girl takes a gun inside of a home, she shoots her father, she then shoots herself. The father, gun enthusiast, sold guns out of his home, 
Put up the picture. Twelve-year-old Texas girl shot a father before taking her own life. Photos obtained by the Daily Mail show. Twelve-year-old girl and a father, 38 years of age, his name Daniel Brown, handling firearms in Pool, Texas. The girl allegedly shot Brown on September 20th, 2022. Brown reportedly had what's called an FFL license. FFL license, allowing him to sell and store firearms, okay? The daughter was said to be in a particular pack that ended life. This pack was with another 12 year old from Lufkin. That girl has been taken into custody and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. The 12 year old girl's case was completed on March 14th, 2023. The state would not disclose her sentence due to the youth privacy laws in play. The second 12 year old female from Lufkin, who sheriff investigators believe was involved with the planning of the shooting, was taken into custody last week and has been charged with conspiracy to commit murder. It remains unclear why the girls wanted to kill their families and run away. How horrible is this? You see, access, access to dangerous weapons can create a long term circumstance that would not have existed if access was not so readily available. Let me put it this way there's a reason why we do not allow 12 year olds to drive a car. Because their maturity, their experience, their motor skills as it relates to driving, not developed enough. They need training, they need proper training. Because a 12 year old driving a car makes that vehicle a weapon. What do you think it does? When a 12 year old gets hold of a gun, let's say a lot of them, guns galore, everybody got guns. So they talk among themselves. While the reason is not known yet, or at least not publicized, I believe there is one. I believe there's more than one reason actually why this happened and why they decided to create this pact. I do not believe they did this just because. But if they did not have access to the guns, whatever they were thinking that week, maybe even that month, without access to those guns, not only is this father okay, but that 12 year old is alive. And they get to talk it out maybe the year later, maybe when she's 14 or 15, she's dead. Jeff thoughts. In this country, we glorify firearms and guns like no other. We have greater access to guns than there are human people in this country. And this is part and parcel to what we could see in a country like ours. Yes, I'm glad the father was actually trying to exercise some form of teaching his child how to use guns properly and safely and everything. And this is going to come at the expense of what we view as guns to be, like a freedom loving thing in this country. So now this family is going to struggle moving forward because they lost family members, uh, friends lost uh, people they know just because we glorify guns in this country so much. We rarely hear stuff like this in other developed wealthy nations. This is terribly sad. That's right. The police, they Beat, according to the narrative, beat and drag a naked, unconscious woman. Here's the video.
put up the picture for a mask. According to the post, you can read it there. It says the woman they're dragging is unconscious, Shreveport police. Shocking video online allegedly shows the Shreveport Police Department beating and dragging a near naked woman. Two graphic videos posted to the social media platform TikTok claim to show heavily armed police officers in Louisiana brutalizing a black woman and dragging her nearly naked across the field. According to the user who posted the video, quote, they was at the trail ride, her and her cousin got into a fight multiple times and she was trying to leave, but her cousin wouldn't give her the keys. When the police came to intervene, the officer reportedly struck the woman in the head, according to follow up comments that you see here. This is not the first time we've covered this department. A Shreveport police officer was arrested in February for shooting for, for the shooting death of an unarmed black man in Louisiana. Officer Alexander Tyler was arrested on a charge of negligent homicide in the shooting death of 43 year old Alonzo Bagley. Let's put him up. Remember that story? Buck stops with the chief. Let's put it with the chief of police. His name is Wayne Smith. His department has yet to make any public comment on the incident or even identify the officers involved. We are requesting that they do so. Um, Doc, this is one of those stories where social media will highlight me, will say, Doc, look at this. They'll tag me, they will tag the show. And all of the pieces are not present. So I say clearly, I want more information. But I'm comfortable, I'm comfortable presenting what I do know in order to get what I do not know. Most would not do that, I do. What we saw was egregious enough. If a person is unconscious, that means likely doc, they need to go to a doctor. They need to go to a hospital if they're unconscious. Why would we drag someone who's unable to respond? So I leave it at that. What say you? I, I really agree. I mean, I think your show does such incredible work in this regard, which is what is the outlet when stuff like this happens? And you're not saying these people should go to jail or these people should not go to jail. You're not weighing in on the outcome. You're saying here's something that really shouldn't happen. And from what we know, there needs to be something. We need to look into this. And more often than not, what it seems like is you're finding some pretty egregious injustice for stories that really aren't told that much. I mean, I'm thinking back about the one we did a couple of months ago about the jail and the and the uh, the guards um, just um, basically destroying a guy who was in a wheelchair or you know yep. that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, the, these stories are stories that are untold, and it's just unfortunate that the legal mechanisms that we can decide if this was just or unjust to put some context around that very often are broken down, and then it turns into Let's shed some light on this. And so I, I think telling the story of what happens here um, is is really important. I mean, I think context is really important, but I'm, I'm just glad there are outlets like this where, where people have something to turn to, uh, to be able to tell that story. Thank you, brother. We appreciate all that you continue to do for the culture as well. All right, a man has been indicted planning to attack a Michigan synagogue. Let's put it up for a mask. A 19 year old Michigan man who was arrested earlier this month on allegations that he used social media to discuss plans to attack a synagogue was indicted Wednesday by a federal grand jury. Sean Patrick Patila was indicted on two counts of threatening communications in interstate commerce and one count of threat to kill or injure by means of fire. That's according to the court documents. So this guy discussed the plan on Instagram. He discussed the attack on Instagram. Court documents verified this, where he frequently posted anti-Semitic remarks about hating Jews and being inspired by the men convicted of two mass shootings in New Zealand and Norway, who shot and killed dozens of people. 
driven to the murders by religious hatred and far right extremism. This would be killer was arrested by the FBI on June 16th. Three days after federal investigators were alerted to his online activity. According to previous court documents following his arrest, investigators searched his phone and found a note referencing Zadik, a synagogue in East Lansing, Michigan. There's the picture, put it up. The date, March 15, 2024, was also found. A reference to the New Zealand mass shooting on March 15, 2019. And a list of equipment, including pipe bombs, Molotov cocktails, and firearms. When investigators searched his home, they found a 12 gauge shotgun, ammunition, several knives, tactical vest, and a Nazi flag. That is your white supremacist starter kit. If convicted as charged, he faces a maximum 10 years in prison for the charge of threatening communications and interstate commerce, and five years for the charge of threat to kill or injure by means of fire. In a report released in March, the Anti-Defamation League found that the number of anti-Semitic incidents in the US rose 36% in 2022 compared to the year before. You see, hate, hate begets hate. You cannot drive out darkness with darkness. That's what Dr. King told us, only light can do that. You cannot become the same evil that you're trying to destroy. It doesn't work that way. When we engage in this fight for civil rights, when we engage in this fight for tolerance, love, respect, we cannot become the thing that we're fighting against. You see, there's a clear distinction between who you are and who they are, never forget that. And in order to have sustainable wins, we must do it in a sustainable way. These individuals who are hell bent on bigotry and racism and hate will never win as long as we don't allow it. Jeff thoughts. You know, Dr. Richie, I'm sure you've gotten this before, and I just want to reference it for myself. When I talk about the injustices of this country and I talk about civil rights, I've been frequently told if I don't love it, leave it, referring mm. to this mm-hmm. country, the United States of America. But this monster here in Michigan found it really easy to shed light on his anti Semitic views to the point where he felt comfortable sharing on social media. Why yep. isn't someone like him told if he doesn't love it, leave it? That's a huge problem. I'm glad this monster is gonna be put in behind bars so he can't do anything like this. And this is only gonna spur someone else to at least attempt something like this. So we gotta stay vigilant and shed light on people like this so justice can prevail, man. That's right, well said. Always a pleasure, dear brother, having you on the program. Tell people how they can follow you, check out your great work. Yeah, you can follow me on Rebel HQ every day of the week. And I have a YouTube channel called We Gonna Be All Right. Thank you, my friend, always a pleasure. Thank you. All right, remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember the truth is always indisputable.